I'm Mohsen. I'm a postdoc at University of Toronto. Uh, I'll be speaking about quantum algorithms. Uh, the rest of this title is a short description of my history working on this area for the past five to six years. I started uh, working on quantum algorithms for fault tolerant quantum, fault -tolerant, uh, quantum computers. Uh, and then recently I'm involved for uh, algorithm for near, uh, near term quantum computers as well. Uh, feel free to ask any question during the presentation if you have any. Uh, so for the, I guess this is not working. Okay, great. So for the first part of my talk, I'll be talking about uh, quantum algorithms for simulating uh, quantum uh, field theories. Uh, before describing the quantum algorithms, let me explain what a uh, quantum field theory is. And let's just start simply by uh, what, what a field is. Field is a function that uh, returns a value in space time. The value is uh, related to some physical parameters. Uh, the value could be a scalar, uh, which for example, it would be a temperature uh, in this room. It could be a vector value, which is one example is the electromagnetic uh, field, which is a vector field. Uh, the value could change over uh, over time, and the field theory is a mathematical description that tells how the value of this field is changing over time. There are some restrictions on the the way that the field is changing, so all the restrictions is within the Hamiltonian or the field theory that describes the the this uh, evolution of the, the field over time. So quantum field theories is a case that we have a superpositions of the fields uh, at, 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 at any time, like a quantum mechanics that describes a, a particle. The particle could be in superposition of all possible states. Quantum field is describing uh, the case that the field is in the superposition of all uh, its uh, possible uh, values. Uh, any field can have a particle, which would be excitations uh, over the field. Uh, and these particles are represented like by bump on the field. If the bump is small and high, it represents a particle with a high momentum. And if it's a small, it represents a particle with a smaller momentum. And what we are interested in quantum field theories or field theory is that the scattering of these particles and look at the, what would be the outgoing particle after the, uh, after the scattering process. We, would, we could have uh, fields that coexist together and each of these fields have their own particles. And if you look at the different fields that is in the nature, we will have this uh, standard uh, model of particle physics, which describes different particles for uh, each of the fields that is, exist in the, in the nature. I'll be specifically focusing on the uh, simplest quantum field theory that we can describe. It's a, it's a scalar fight for theory which describes the Higgs boson is given by this Hamiltonian. The Hamiltonian has a free part and interacting part. The free part is just a quadratic term, which could be like, think of it as a bunch of uh, connected harmonic oscillators. And the interaction is a nonlinear term, which is the pi to the four. And the name is coming from, from that. Uh, this is not a toy uh, field theory, although it's the simplest field theory. It describes the Higgs boson uh, in the stable. So before going, uh, before going to tell you uh, why, uh, how we simulate the, a quantum field theory, let me tell you why we need to simulate a quantum field theory. At the end, a field theory is a theory. So we need to verify it by the experiments. And uh, uh, if it's a good theory, it should be verified whatever the experiment is uh, uh, telling us. So to do the experiment, this is a large heart like collider. It's the largest physics experiment in the, in the world. So in order to do this, uh, to verify uh, the results of a quantum field theory, this kind of experiment, which is very expensive to run, uh, tells us whether the field theory is uh, consistent with the experiment or not. So it's kind of verification of field theory. So uh, simulation is another way of uh, verification. And also we see this kind of funny things that the physics paper coming out of this uh, uh, colliders have so many authors, many people involved in, in 
in like this doing this experiment in order to uh, verify the results of a quantum field theory. So in order to simulation, uh, what we do is firstly we go to the classical methods. For the classical methods, like the one method is using the Feynman diagrams, which are these Feynman diagrams that are used uh, to do some calculation. It simplifies some calculations, uh, but it only applies for big coupling field theory. It also breaks down in high precisions. So these are not useful for any type of quantum field theory that we are interested. Uh, an alternative method is lattice quantum field theories. Uh, these methods uh, apply for, uh, uh, they, they are good for static quantities and they have like high precision for calculating uh, them up to 12 bits of precision. Some of them calculate, some of the uh, quantities are calculated with this high precision using this method. But, it's, but they are not useful for uh, studying this, uh, the dynamics of a, uh, the theory or the system that we have. So the question that we have is, can we efficiently simulate quantum field theories using quantum computer? So if the answer turns out to be yes, it would be great. And if it's no, and uh, also it would be great because we, would, we could think of other type of computers, maybe quantum field computers in order to like, encompass like anything that happens in the nature. So uh, in order to simulate on uh, field theories on a quantum computer, we write algorithms. Algorithms are like this, this kind of circuits, which we start from some uh, easy to prepare state, we perform some uh, operations on them. And at the end, we have some state which represent the state of a system. Here would be a state of a quantum field. And then we can extract the information from the uh, state representing that quantum system in order to you know, get, get, get information of the physical observables. Uh, sometimes we have to run this algorithm many times in order to get useful information after uh, post-processing the data. When we are casting this algorithm, we are counting this number of gates as a measure of time or runtime of the algorithm. Uh, in some scenarios, which doesn't, yeah, sure. In some scenarios, some of these gates are very expensive to apply. So we count them, those expensive to apply gates as the measure of time uh, for the quantum algorithms. But for, in the case of classical algorithms, we don't uh, count this low level operation, we count high level operations. Would be like a uh, number of clocks that we are doing uh, in, in, in one classical algorithm. So when in this time that quantum algorithms are getting mature, uh, we will be looking at the high level operations as a measure of our runtime. We will be counting the number of high level operations and interestingly, these high-level operations are those operations that are very expensive to apply. It would be a very, you know, quantum version of random access uh, machine for classical computing. There are some building blocks of quantum algorithms that are used in, as a subroutine in many algorithms or Hamiltonian simulation. Uh, in this problem, we are given a Hamiltonian. And what we want to do is to simulate the time evolution operator, which is this operation. Uh, that we compose this operation in terms of like basic operations that, we, uh, that I described earlier. In order to do efficient simulation, we have to be given this uh, Hamiltonian and uh, efficient way, which are usually, uh, they are given by oracles, where the oracles specify uh, the location of non-zero elements uh, in the Hamiltonian and also the value of those non-zero elements. So we can query these uh, oracles and get these values, construct the algorithm which simulate the Hamiltonian, which would be a subroutine for a larger algorithm for simulating quantum systems. Uh, the complexity of uh, quantum algorithms for Hamiltonian simulation scales polar logarithmically with the dimension of the metrics. Also, if you, if you have a, a error tolerance, it's Polarogarithmic in uh, one over epsilon as well. And it has been shown that the optimal algorithm is a scale linearly with the time, which is the no fast arriving theorem. Mm -hmm. So uh, this is uh, one of the main uh, subroutine in many algorithms for simulating quantum systems. Sorry, polynomially yep. with the dimension or with the number of qubits or polylog with the number of qubits? Yeah. It's a polylog in the, dimen uh, the dimension of the matrix. 
So probably not going to run the number here. Yeah. Yeah. But classically, it would be exponential in the dimension. So uh, for simulating quantum field theory, it follows uh, like a, the structure of quantum algorithm for simulating any quantum system. We start with qubits in all zero state. We prepare some initial state, evolve the state, and then perform some measurement on the evolved state and get the classical uh, outcomes. We can run the algorithm many times, post process the classical outcome in order to get the uh, values of uh, some interesting observables related to the system. Uh, for quantum field simulation, the initial state generation involves uh, preparing a stage, a states which represent particles before the interaction. Those are interacting particles. So in order to do so, we typically use, we uh, prepare the ground state of the non-interacting part of the theory, and we go to the interaction regime uh, by adiabatic evolution. We prepare particles of free theory out of the ground state of the free field theory. And then we have free particles by adiabatic evolution, we would have uh, interacting particles before the time evolution. In the time evolution part, which is a Hamiltonian simulation, it evolves uh, the state of the particles and uh, the scattering occurs in this time evolution. At the end, we perform measurements uh, on those uh, scattered particles. The measurement could be in the interaction regime or we can just go back to the pre-regime and do the, do the measurement on, on, on that regime. Typically, we uh, are interested on in the momentum of the outgoing particles. So what is measured are momentums of the state uh, representing uh, the particles after the scattering. Well, this is the seminal papers of the KDO describing like the, the typical way of simulating a quantum field theory. So uh, to, to simulate a quantum field theory, because it inherently is a, a continuum system, we have to discretize it. We have to truncate the space, discretize it, and then digitize each value of the truncate, discretize uh, field. Uh, each value of the discretized field would be any number, minus infinity to plus infinity if it's a real field. So in the digitization part, we represent those fields by bits if you are doing classical simulation or qubits by uh, if you are doing quantum simulation. Discretization by this lattice that we are writing in is a typical way. Alternative way is using wavelets. Wavelets are uh, special functions that you can translate these functions and dilate them and generate a basis for this, for the space of the functions that uh, are the space of the fields uh, that we are working on. Here we have this uh, blue, the blue one is a scaling function. You can translate it, generate a basis, and uh, which would be like a complete basis for the space of the functions that we are working. Uh, we can also use scaling functions along with the wavelets. We are the shrink versions of the wavelets. You can generate a multi-scale basis for the space of functions, and then you can use that as a way to transforming, uh, transforming a continuum system to a countable con uh, system. No matter what way of discretization you use, uh, the ground state remains a Gaussian state for the quadratic Hamiltonian that I described. But the coherence matrix here, the matrix at the top of the exponential, depends on the way that you're disc uh, discretizing. If you use the lattice based uh, uh, simulations, the, the blue one would be the, the, the figure on the left would be your uh, coherence matrix, the square root of the matrix K. Uh, the, the other figure represents when we are using multi scale wavelet basis. It has a, this nice pattern that it would be like a bands of a finger, it's called the finger pattern structure matrix. Can you explain what these axes are, what these plots are? Uh, the plots are, uh, this plots represent the matrix and the color of the plot represent the value of the, the matrix. The matrix that we have is the K to the half on the top of the exponential, uh, which, which is the coherence matrix of the uh, ground state of the quantum field theory, the part of the quantum field theory. So what we are doing here is just we are taking the inner product of the, uh, the, the basis function that we have, or the derivative of them. Uh, it depends on the Hamiltonian. And 
if the Hamiltonian is free, that's the ground state, the, the, the K matrix representing the coupling between different terms. If you take the square root of it, it would be the covariance matrix of the uh, Gaussian state in two dimension that would be our Gaussian state. And if you diagonalize it, the standard variation of uh, each Gaussian would be uh, encoded in this covariance matrix. Is that the uh, answer? Uh, okay, so when, when we have this uh, matrices that is coming from the discretization of the uh, fields, if you do the multi scale wavelet basis, most of the elements are close to zero and it doesn't depend on the mass term of the Hamiltonian. For any mass term that you use, that would be your structure. If you remove those close to zero values, you would have like sparse metrics. And then you, using the sparsity of the metrics, you can construct the algorithm that is uh, uh, optimal, which I showed. But if you use the uh, lattice space method or fixed scale method, this would be our matrix. It's, uh, we can diagonalize this matrix as well efficiently by Fourier transform, it's a circular matrix. And we can construct also algorithm based on that method. So, question. So you mentioned that they use uh, one K, you have space. Yeah. So of course, for the initial state, you can yeah, it's clear to decide the uh, interpretation, but then you go it in time. So how do you know what? We truncate the space, which is the domain of the functions that we are working with. Uh, that's the truncation. But when we are discretizing, we are discretizing that uh, truncated space. In the latter space method, we are. The discretization is discretization of the domain, but in the wavelet basis, what we are discretizing is the, the space of the functions. So we are taking countable to uncountable. Uncount the truncation, I'm telling you, say, this space, yeah, it's X, uh, yeah, your coordinate is X. So you have oh, the X here represent the field. So this X could be like phi. Phi is the state of the field. So in the ground state, we have superposition of different field distributions. Except when you say that the field X is a vector, this you're saying K is a matrix. So uh, yeah, a yeah. In all different yeah, yeah, exactly. It's infinite dimensional, uh, but once once we are doing the discretization uh, or truncation, also we have two types of truncation, maybe like that's okay. part of. One is this truncation of the space itself, and the, the other one is truncation of the field. Uh, the, you know, the, the Hilbert instead space. Instead of using wavelets, we have a non interacting theory, and we just did a usual you know, Fourier decomposition. You take energy modes, K modes. Yeah. Then this root K would just be diagonal, right? Because yes. So you get a more complicated matrix because of the wavelet decomposition that you would choose. Uh, if you work on the momentum basis, that would be diagonal, yeah. but it's not in the momentum uh, basis, it's on the field, field representation. So even if you use the Fourier basis, uh, it's like uh, we have the phi. About the different k modes of the field. Yeah, it would be phi versus the derivative of phi. Derivative phi is the fit, the momentum representation, but the phi itself is the, the field representation. So when when we, when we have this Hamiltonian here, uh, like I have to go back. Uh, yeah, this Hamiltonian here, we are representing this Hamiltonian in a basis. So what you're taking, you're taking the inner product of this uh, Hamiltonian with respect to the basis functions. So if you're using the wavelet, it would be like one wavelet function, another wavelet function, Hamiltonian here, take the, the integral. So it would be like, so you would have a different functions and if you put them together, it would be a matrix that describes the coupling between different modes. But if you use uh, the, uh, you know, if you use the lattice discretization or fixed scale disc discretization, that would be a blue plot. Wavelet would be other plot. If you use the uh, the uh, the Fourier basis, because you're taking the gra gradient, everything it it it, it becomes a diagonal in that basis. And yeah, you're right. Matrix becomes sparse. Yeah. That's Specifically, because you make a clever choice of this wavelet basis, or you're saying it's kind of a generic property? 
in uh, it depends on the Hamiltonian for this part, this port, this this kind of Hamiltonian, it becomes a sparse. For complicated Hamiltonian, if you take this one, it's not necessarily sparse. So it depends on the operator that you're representing on the basis. Sure, but even for and, the simple Hamiltonian, I'm just asking. Is metric guaranteed to be sparse? Yeah, guaranteed to, to be sparse. So even if you didn't do the wavelet? No. Okay. Uh, if you do the multi-scale wavelet decomposition, it would be a sparse. If you do fixed scale, it won't be sparse anymore. That's the property of the multi-scale. And that's one useful feature of the wavelets that when you're going to multi-scale, it becomes a sparse matrix. What you're doing is like, you are representing this differential operators on a wavelet basis, and it, it has been shown that for many differential operator, this representation becomes a sparse matrix. Uh, okay, so alternatively, we can use the fixed scale basis also, but we have that. Uh, do you have? Yeah. What you mean by fixed scale or scale? Uh, the fixed scale, we just take the scaling functions, translate them generate a space, which would, would be a subspace of our Hilbert space. But if you shrink the scaling functions small enough, generating them, you're uh, increasing this, uh, the subspace of the Hilbert space that rep are represented by these functions. So that would be itself an uh, alternative way of representing this square integral functions. So do you end up generating a Hilbert space? Uh, complete basis. No, it's, it's complete basis. It's not. It's not over complete like uh, uh, Gaussians. It's not a Gaussian. These are orthogonal functions, which generate a uh, complete basis. But it depends on the way that you are generating it, it. Whether if you use the scaling functions or the scaling functions along with wavelets in different scales, it would be different way of characterizing the Hilbert space by okay. using these functions. Can you actually explain what the attributes on the wavelet plots are? Like what's S of X and what's W of X? Oh, it's, uh, it's coming from the wavelets. Wavelets are defined by two basic functions. They are called scaling functions and wavelet functions. They are not unique. You can use this wavelet, which is the hard wavelet. You can use the other wavelets. When you're in, uh, they're, it's specified by one parameter. When you're increasing the parameter, the functions of the scaling or wavelet functions become more smoother, but they are getting wider. So they are not more, they are compact, but the, 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 the domain of them are getting wider. So it's like three, and if you go increase it, it would be five, it would be seven, and you're, you're gonna get like larger. It's not a unique basis. It depends on this functions, but you cannot choose any function. It must satisfy some criteria to be a useful basis for, for the space of. Are these like little wiggle edges in those real or that's just like math mathematical decisions? Uh, for this, for this one, uh, yeah. these are not differentiable functions. They are not continuously differentiable functions, but the other one is continuously differentiable function. The wavelet that I use is the, the latter one because the derivative that we have is the first time, we need first time differentiable functions in order to exactly calculate the elements of the matrix. But it depends on your application and which wavelet to use. Typically, this wavelet, Dobeshi wavelets of order three, is used for many applications because of this. They, they have nice property. But if you go to higher order, it would be more smoother, more differentiable uh, functions. But again, it depends on your application. It's not unique like the Fourier transform. We would have. Yeah, we, what we do in. Uh, Generating the ground state is that we take the, the inputs. The inputs would be the parameter that specify the wavelet, would be like the K parameter. The other parameter specify the Hamiltonian. The Hamiltonian that we are working is just one parameter, the mass parameter, and not, would be like the number of modes that we are working and the error tolerance that we have. So we classically post process this uh, parameters, compute some parameters that using those computer, computed parameters. As an in classical input to the quantum algorithms, we generate the states that approximately represent the state of the Gaussian state of the Hamilton. What we do basically, we have that uh, multi-dimensional Gaussian state. 
we prepared a bunch of one dimensional Gaussian state and then we perform one basis transformation. If we use that fixed scale basis, because we can diagonalize it by Fourier transform, the basis transformation would be like you're efficiently applying the Fourier, uh, uh, Fourier transform to get the multi uh, to get to the multi uh, dimensional case. But if you use the wavelet basis and you diagonalize the matrix, but it's not a unitary diagonalization, you bring it to the diagonal form uh, by Cholesky decomposition. And this, this shear, uh, the, you have to specify, because it's not uni uh, unitary transform, you have to specify the elements of the matrix. This S matrix are specified, uh, pro the parameter that is specified the transformation. We take that as a classical input into the basis transformation and map it to bunch of one dimensional Gaussians to a one Gaussians of one dimensional, one multi dimensional Gaussians. So we show that like even like classical and quantum parts, because is the scales closer linearly with the number of uh, the number of modes. And we also show that this is optimal. Any algorithm that uh, is uh, sublinear in terms of the number of modes would generate a state that won't be accurately representing the ground state of the uh, free field theory. So part of it is uh, coming from generating one dimensional Gaussian state. The method that we use, uh, we, we use a novel method for it uh, based on some, doing some uh, testing in an inequality on a quantum computer. What we do, we are doing this kind of transformation where we have three registers here the last register is one single qubit. It's the flag register. And the flag is up when the value of the first register is greater than the second one. Otherwise, it keeps down. And we can do this in, in superposition on quantum computer. This enables us to prepare some states much more efficiently than the standard methods. Like if the, we have the Gaussian state, which I have shown like half of it here, the blue line, this is what we want to prepare. But we can uh, prepare a state with that orange line efficiently. What we do, we prepare the origin, uh, the, the orange line, and we map this state with the orange uh, amplitudes to a state with blue amplitudes. The way that we do is we compute the ratio of them in, alternate, in another register. And what we want to do is map the content of this register to the G in order to get the F, the blue register. We do this by this performing that operation, the inequality testing. So the, the whole operation that we are doing, the, the computation that we have here is just computing the one single exponential, which is the ratio of the blue versus the range lines. Whereas in the standard methods, we have to do like complex arithmetic operation in order to prepare the same states. We remove this uh, uh, arithmetic from the uh, algorithms in order to prepare the same state much more efficiently. Uh, going to beyond the ground state is preparing the free particles. When we are using multi-scale wavelet bases, we have a description of the theory in multiple scales. And we can use this description in order to generate the states representing the particle. For one dimensional case, this would be a Gaussian state. It's just one single harmonic oscillator. You, you take the creation operator, apply it to it. You will have one uh, state that represents one particle state. You can go into like change the uh, change the uh, the domain of the function in order to go higher momentum functions because we have the description in multiple scales. We have the description of this kind of operations. We can apply them and generate them all this, all, all at the same time if you want. Whereas if you use the fixed scale basis, what you do is like you, you have to generate this state, do some manipulation in order to go to other states, which adds more cost to the algorithm generating the states of uh, particles. These are non-unitary uh, non operations. We do some tricks in order to uh, uh, implement them. Um, and also when we break the translation of invariance on the system, uh, we add some terms that are uh, breaks the translation of invariance. But even with those terms, the, the structure of the matrix doesn't change. And the algorithm is heavily depend on the structure 
And it also covers the case that we have uh, uh, non translational invariant field theories. We can uh, generate states of those theories using multi scale basis. The last part is extracting information from uh, those generated states. So, formally, what we have, we have a generated quantum state psi. We have given a error tolerance and we have a measurement observable. And what we want is a, a, an epsilon approximation to the, uh, this uh, uh, expectation value. The metrics that the observable that we check is general observable. We take it like the oracles, specify the location and value of the non zero elements. If you use the standard methods, there are a bunch of methods like the Hadamard test, which you just run this uh, simple circuits. You have to repeat this uh, circuit in order to uh, uh, get the information. And the, the number of repetition depends on your uh, error uh, epsilon. Other alternative way of uh, calculating this expectation value, which depends on Hamiltonian simulation. You do like this kind of tricks. You do Hamiltonian simulation for a short amount of time, and then do some tricks in order to get the uh, expectation value. For all of these methods, uh, the runtime with respect to the epsilon is not linear. The best case is this one, where the tilde represents like we are, when we are ignoring some logarithmic factors out of the uh, cost of the algorithms. What we do, we bypass the Hamiltonian simulations and construct a way uh, to calculate the expectation value but by calculating by amplitude. And the complexity is exactly linear with respect to uh, one over epsilon. This is the Heisenberg limits, which applies for general observable. You cannot do based on the Heisenberg, you cannot go sublinear. But the way that we prove it uh, mathematically is uh, the optimality of the algorithm is uh, reducing the approximate one problem, which is called the approximate mean problem to the measurement problem. The first problem is proven to be optimal with respect to the error epsilon. Uh, in that case, we have a function given by Oracle and we query the Oracle in order to get the average of the functions over the values. The number of queries scales uh, linearly with one over epsilon. And that's proven to be optimal. We reduce it to this problem and show that this is also optimal. This also, this I should mention that applies for general case there are cases that we can break the Heisenberg limits and we can have sublinear algorithm, but this is the best thing that we can do for a general case. Uh, so this is what, we, what I had to talk about the far, far uh, term quantum computers. Uh, so the, for the last part, I'm gonna talk about the empirical hardness models, uh, which are uh, tools that we can use uh, for uh, predicting uh, hardness or complexity of one algorithm. So we are looking at the average case complexity rather than the worst case complexities that I've mostly described on the first part of the, so my talk. So question then about the first part. So what types of questions can you address with these methods? So you took care of the initial theory. Yeah. So just when you show, for example, they discuss the experiments, of course, the pollution. Yeah. So can you use these types of? Yeah, for the for general algorithm, that I described is like it involves Hamiltonian simulation and measurements. The Hamiltonian simulation is already optimal. What we are, what we were working on on the initial state preparation because that was the most expensive part of the whole algorithm. So we really moved that part to be more expensive. So the entire algorithm now is optimal, but for one class of uh, uh, quantum field theory is not for any you know, like standard models. It's just the uh, Simplest quantum field theories, so, but yeah. So then, more broadly, what types of questions can you address with this? Uh, it would be like a scattering process, simulating a scattering process in quantum field theories, measuring momentums of the outgoing particles, or any other things that we are relevant to quantum field theories. These are the questions that we can address by quantum simulations. Is it being done? Yeah, yeah. That's uh, you know the first part of the the, the Hamiltonian simulation or the measurement, there, there are uh, algorithms for doing it. The uh, state generation part was the, the most expensive part. We removed that part, but for a, another type of uh, quantum field theory, you have to devise like is uh, quantum field theory dependent. 
uh, but for par particular class of field theories, you can uh, do all of this operation and calculate some of, you know, expectation value of some observables related to field theory. But mostly what, I've, what has been done is calculating, uh, simulating a scattering process and also calculating some uh, uh, expectation value related to quantum field theories. When you say what's been done, you mean what people have designed algorithms to do, not yeah. what's actually been implemented on a quantum field. No, no, these are, you know, far future thing, which are, you know, theoretically show that by quantum computers, you can simulate this type of quantum field theories. So I guess what, what I'm curious about is how far do we have to get to actually see quantum advantage for a quantum field theory calculation? How many good tools do we need? In order to do the sim simplest quantum field theory that, uh, that I... To do something faster than we could do it on the classical computer. Uh, this is exponential on the classical computer. That's yeah, yeah. Yeah, in order to do it, uh, I've just, with a rough estimate, I've constructed a method that it requires 1,000 logical qubits in order to like very simple calculations and also with not so accurate calculations. But, but you think already a calculation that would be hard classically? Yeah, it would be hard classically. Okay. We can do the, those, but it's like, more, as I said, for so simplest quantum. That's not good. Thousand, <laughs> if, if, you, if, you, if you have a thousand logical qubits, perfectly functioning uh, operators, then we will have, uh, we would be doing something that we cannot be doing uh, classically. But that's something might not be something that is uh, useful or describing something very important. Uh, yeah, but we are very far away from simulating a standard model of like yeah, this type. Of. So for the uh, empirical hardness model, so we typically when we are considering problem, the hardness of the problem. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm just wondering about the classical hardness of it because. It seems like you already know, like, you don't know the exact eigenstate, but you know a sparse representation already. Yeah. So, is it, is it clear that this, you could make a classical algorithm that takes advantage of that sparsity to some kind of perturbative? Yeah, the, the issue is that we want to generate a state, even for like 40 qubits. The space, the memory that we need to store that 40 qubit would be more than four terabytes. So if you make it 41 qubit, it's like exponentially exploding space that we need to represent the field. So it's just be just stuck in the representation, not alone to go to the uh, simulating the dynamics or so even the representation you're talking about. So like qubit solution to change this representation. Or... It doesn't matter in. It doesn't matter uh, what representation that you're using, but if you want to generate the ground state on a bunch of qubits, uh, the memory size that you need to represent the states is exponential with respect to the like the yeah, number yeah. of qubits. So, it would... so, so even though the matrix is sparse, you're saying the number of elements that I need to keep track of in the matrix is still growing exponentially. Yeah, that's, that, that, that's, that's the issue. Slower exponentially. Yeah, that, that completely answer. But okay. Okay. If it's, shall I continue? Okay, so uh, for hardness of a problem, we classify the problem based on the hardness. There are e classically easy problems or quantumly easy problems, but there are problems that are hard even for quantum computers. Uh, there are examples of it, like traveling salesman problem. When you are a bunch of cities and you're looking at a close pass in this city that visits every city and has the shortest pass. Uh, it's a widely studied problem in classical uh, setting. It also applied to monkeys that mimic the traveling salesman uh, thing. Uh, it's been studied for centuries and there is no efficient algorithm for this type of problem. The other one is a uh, satisfiability problem that you have a bunch of different clauses that, and you want to satisfy all of them. Uh, specifically, if you look at the tree sap problem where the size of each uh, clauses is three, that would be an NP-complete problem, which are the class of the very hard problems in, uh, for, for any type of the algorithms. Uh, for larger uh, 
process, you can map it to tree sand. So for these are the parts of this very hard problems. And uh, there is no efficient algorithm for them. They are widely used in applications for different uh, industries. There are people constructed algorithms for solving this thing. Uh, but when we are considering this uh, efficiency of this algorithm, so the main question that we are answering in the Himmerkern Hotness model is how hard is it to solve the given uh, uh, problems in uh, practice using the best available algorithms that we already have for this type of a problem. Clearly the uh, theoretical analysis is uh, hopeless here. For example, if you look at this year, we have 500 nodes. And if you look at the traveling salesman problem for this randomly generated 500 nodes, it wouldn't be by theoretical analysis, we wouldn't be able to solve it within our lifetime. Whereas I'm gonna run one algorithm, which is looking at, it's not running, it's not running, but, <laughs> but there is like an algorithm that looks at uh, uh, the traveling salesman on this uh, graphs. So it takes only five seconds to solve it. And I didn't use- Solve it approximately or solve it exactly? Exactly, five seconds. But if you change the problem, it's not going to be five seconds. It might be 10 seconds or 15 seconds. I didn't need a special tool. It's my finicky laptop, seven year old laptop, low spec. It took five seconds. It depends on the solvers that you're uh, looking. There are two competing solvers for traveling salesman problem. The first one can exactly solve with bonded size problem instances of close to 86,000 nodes. There is one heuristic algorithm that solves this problem for a node of 110,000 that, that size. Uh, what we see, if, uh, it didn't show here, but if I run this algorithm again for different uh, problem instances, it, would, it wouldn't take like a second. It could take like longer time. So what we have this competing algorithms for solving uh, the same problem is that uh, first, it doesn't have any uh, theoretical guarantees that to have exact solution, although for bonded size problem, there could be algorithms like the Concordia that I've shown here. It is exact. Uh, it works surprisingly well in practice, like the example that I showed here. And also uh, the performance of this algorithm varies a lot. It could take a few days or a few months or a few milliseconds to solve the same problem that theoretical analysis shows that you cannot solve it show me. So just, just to make sure I understood. Yeah. You're saying a generic problem like this would take our lifetime to solve, but specific instances happen to work quickly on this. Yeah. So this one took five seconds, but you chose this one because you know what? Uh, yeah, so it, 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 it highly depends on the problem. In sense. If I change the position of one of this thing, one of the new, this nodes, it wouldn't take like seconds. It could take a few days. It could take like a lifetime. But for many, uh, uh, not specifically for this, because the Concordia has been shown that it's uh, exact, but it's for bonded size problem. But for general problem instances, it's not the case. It, it's exponential. Uh, so in the empirical hardness models, what we are looking, we are looking at the models that predicts the performance of those algorithms for given problem instance distributions. It has a bunch of steps. The first step is you select one algorithm among a set of competing algorithms for solving the same problem. The second step is uh, selecting a problem instance distribution. When you have a different problem instances, you're selecting a bunch of them, like you know, graphs of size 500 to 1000. That would be your problem distribution. You are identifying a set of features or parameters that characterizes your problem. The features must have two main properties. This must be fast to compute, much faster than the problem itself. It must be informative in the sense that it must correlate with the performance of the algorithm. If it's easy to solve problem, the feature must tell us. And if it's like a hard problem, it also distinguish between easy to solve or easy to prove that it's not solvable versus the hard to solve uh, problem instances. You're generating the data for this problem distribution that you have. And then at the last step, you're learning a model which predicts the uh, hardness of your problem. Typically it's runtime, 
where you have the actual runtime of the algorithm versus the predicted runtime of the algorithm. It's empirical in the sense that you have to run the algorithm to get the empirical results and then construct a model that predicts the performance of the algorithm for new problem instances. Sorry. So what are the arguments of this? Oh, this is actual hardness of the problem versus the predicted hardness by the model. Hardness is the thing that we care about. It would be runtime, it would be accuracy of the algorithm, it could be any other parameters that we have. So we looked at one of these problems, the Hamiltonian cycle problem, closely related to a travel and salesman problem. What we are looking, we are given a graph, looking for a closed path uh, in, in this graph that visits every node only once. And the question that we have is how long does it take to find the Hamiltonian cycle for a given graph? The problem in sense distribution that we took is specific graphs, cubic graphs, where the graphs with nodes three, have nodes of three. And the number of nodes is between 300 to 1150. We took uh, the Concordia solver. We put the cap time of 10 seconds for, for that solver. So you're looking at the problem instance distribution that can be solved within 10 seconds with that solver. At the, we overall have the, around 70,000 problem instances. We excluded this cap uh, data from the all data points. At the end, we have 40,000, close to 40,000 uh, problem distribution, problem instances that can be solved within 10 seconds with that solver. And we constructed a model that predicts the performance or uh, uh, performance or runtime of the, the concordy for this set of uh, uh, problem, problem instances that we have considered. As you see, it has a high Pearson correlation values. So it looks from this plot like as you go to harder problems or longer runtimes, the actual runtime is almost always shorter than the predicted runtime. Is that just an artifact of like not letting it run long enough or something? Just for the for the easier problems, you don't see that, right? Uh, yeah, it, it highly depends on your problem instances. We have include we have excluded those uh runtimes as lo taking longer than 10 seconds. But if it's like in the so larger the portion of the time. The right, and almost everything is below the red line. Yeah. So on the left, it looks like it's often harder than you predicted. On the right, it looks like it's always easier than you predicted. Is that real, or is that because something's been left out of these plots? Uh, I'm not sure about this to answer to this. It seems mm -hmm. shocking. Yeah, but it's like it, it has, as you can see, it's like pretty good model to predict the performance of the algorithm for a given problem instances. So if you have a New problem, you can use this model in order to predict its runtime. Uh, and also its log of the runtime. So it, it's for- yeah, It looks like it's overestimating the runtimes by a factor of 10 to 100. Uh, uh, right. I, I'm just curious. Uh, okay, maybe, maybe I, think, uh, I, I need to take a closer look at this, uh, this problem, but yeah, that's, uh, that's one application of the empirical hardness models is that when you are given a problem, you construct an algorithm analyzer that analyzes its hardness based on this modeling. And the other one is when you have a set of uh, algorithm for solving the same problem, you can use the empirical hardness model uh, to select the best algorithm that solves that set of problem instance distributions. It would be like algorithm selector, like a meta algorithm for. Uh, choosing the best algorithm. The last application is configuring the parameterized algorithms. When you have an algorithm that depends on so many parameters, with respect to some problem distance, uh, distance distribution, you can uh, tune these parameters using empirical hardness model that applies for that set of problems and chooses the best uh, parameters for that problem. So uh, it's just the final minute, I'm just a, uh, our vision for quantum case, uh, which is a, a work uh, currently being done. What we want to do is apply empirical hardness model to configuring the near-term algorithm, which is mostly parameterized uh, um, quantum algorithms. And we will be looking at the parameters that uh, makes the algorithm to perform well for particular problem distributions. We can also make a quantum meta algorithm that selects the best uh, algorithm among a set of 
quantum heuristic algorithms for particular uh, uh, for particular problems that we have. Also, there are problems that you, there are characteristic of features that you cannot calculate them efficiently classically, but if are like some correlation functions that you can calculate them efficiently in quantum computer, we can use them as a feature for classical empirical hardness models. And the final goal is to construct purely quantum empirical hardness model to predict the performance of the quantum algorithm for uh, different things. Uh, the end, thank you for listening. Also thank many people that were involved in this uh, different things that I mentioned and different funding agencies. Thank you. Thank you.